Hello there viewers, uh, you're getting the view out the window of the Angry Mobile as we head off for an angry Christmas. Uh, as requested by multiple people, people wanted to know what the Australian countryside looked like. Now, uh, this bit is more interesting than some of the bits we will be at later. At least there are trees here. Once we get into New South Wales, there's going to be a lot of flat nothing. I'll probably show you that too. Uh, this bit of road is the best bit of road we get on the whole trip. Once you get out of Melbourne, there's a separated dual carriageway all the way to the New South Wales border. So when you're heading north out of Melbourne, that's a pretty good deal. It's straight uninterrupted run all the way to the New South Wales border. And then the road gets kind of crap after that, or at least very inconsistent, sometimes down to a single lane each way on a major highway is pretty ordinary. And we are not even going to stick on that supposedly major road. We're going to turn off and go down some country roads. So it'll get a bit interesting in the Chinese sense of the word. For those who've never heard that expression, what I'm referring to is there's an old Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. And people aren't sure whether that's a blessing or a curse, because sometimes interesting can get pretty damn difficult to deal with. So it's a little phrase uh, I have with some friends of mine when things look like they might be getting a tad complicated and difficult to manage. We refer to that being interesting in the Chinese sense. But anyway, there's a little bit of Australian countryside and I promised I was going to ramble and cover a bunch of topics. Seeing this is more or less the beginning of this video, I'll start at more or less the beginning of what I'm doing on YouTube. Now, long time subscribers, viewers and those who go through the back catalogue will have heard lots of this. So apologies to you, but a lot of people ask me this, and even though I committed to video now, a lot of people will ask me again in the future, but what the heck. Okay, why am I on YouTube? What am I hoping to achieve? To go for some very deep background, people often ask me about my background. I have training in theater. I have a degree, BA in communications, in a strand that was known as Theatre Media, where I went to college, which was called Mitchell College back in the day. Uh, these days is part of Charleston University. Uh, there's a communications degree that had three strands. Journalism, which I originally wanted to get into, but changed my mind because they were all jerks. Uh, and that was the number one journalism course in the country regarded from both an academic and an industry perspective as the top journalism course in the country, which makes me think the others must suck something fierce, because by God, we had some idiots there. Uh, and I could have gotten into that course, uh, and I chose not to. There were two other strands. One was public, public relations, which I wasn't gonna touch with a 40-foot barge pole, and the other was theatre media. And that's what I went into. I was actually, I got really lousy marks at high school. Kids, if you get bad marks at high school, don't let that hold you back. Uh, I like to think, in fact, by all measures, you know, uh, I am not unintelligent, but school bored me and I didn't do the work, so I got bad grades, uh, or ordinary, very ordinary grades. And, but I, I scraped into an associate diploma, two year course at a college, and when I was in the middle of that, I sucked up to the right people and I could transfer into a degree course with some credits I'd built up. And I had my choice. I could have done the journalism or the theatre. And after talking to the people who ran both courses, the guy running the journalism course was an utter jerk. And I didn't want to have anything to do with him. So, I went into the theatre course, never regretted it. Journalism course, great for getting a job, 
people I went to college with, uh, with all the major networks, radio, magazines, newspapers. They got great jobs, uh, but just not for me. Uh, the theatre course was a great course. Not good for getting a job. But that's the sacrifice you make sometimes. But the point in bringing all that rambling story up, I did a theatre theater degree. So people sometimes say, well, you know, you're sort of good at the performance, the voice, the characters, the writing. How did you get to be good? Uh, I'm trained. I have classical training. We did the whole range of stuff from the classics. I was going to say like Shakespeare, but we did serious classics, the Greek classics. Uh, we did Shakespeare, of course. Uh, we did improvisational stuff, Commedia dell'arte, right up to modern stuff. And I also majored in writing, besides the performance stuff. And I did a lot of radio work when I was at college too, so I got a lot of practice using my voice, which is why I am more confident than some when I'm doing my performance. So I did that, uh, and then, in all honesty, never really used the degree, even though it was fun. Uh, left college, was unemployed. Looking through the job ads one day, there was an ad that said, hey, out of work, voice actors. What well, out of work actors, use your voice skills. And I rang up to find out what that was about because I was essentially an out of work actor and never been in work, but certainly sort of qualified as an out of work actor. And it turned out it was a telemarketing job. They just wanted people with good voices for the phone. And I did that for a while, but I really hate selling things to people who don't want them. But then a friend sort of invited me to where he was working into customer service. It was like a sideways thing, taking inbound calls. So for a couple of years, my job was to talk on the telephone. Uh, eventually I got a promotion in one place I was working in and I was managing a team. And then one day, because I've always had an affinity with computer systems, the manager suggested I should look at applying for the opening they had in a role called business analyst. And I found out what that was, sounded okay, so I applied, got the job. That's what I've been doing ever since, about 12 or 13 years now. I've been a business analyst in the IT field and a contractor most of that time because <laughs> you get lots more money as a contractor. So anyway, so I'm working in IT in an office, not using my theatre degree. And a couple of years ago, I got sick of that and thought I should do something. Probably coincided with when I'd run into a friend of mine who did the same course. Uh, one Mr. Adrian Collier, who I've mentioned a few times. He had quite a good career in stand-up comedy in Australia. Uh, and he got sick, or bastard, got rheumatoid arthritis, which meant he really couldn't stand up to the rigours of touring as a stand-up comic. And he reinvented himself as a director. And that's when I met him. He was directing shows at the Comedy Festival in Melbourne. He actually specialises in mentoring younger comics who want to refine their skills because a lot of people who go into comedy just think they're funny. Sometimes they're right, but they very rarely have any discipline. They very rarely have any classical training. And so Adrian essentially beats a lot of these guys into shape and turns them into better performers, more confident performers, people who can structure a show rather than just say a couple of funny lines. So, meeting up with Adrian kindled my uh, passions for performance again, and I thought I should do something. And blogging was very big, this is about three years ago. Blogging was very big, and I thought I'd always liked writing, I should practice that, uh, I should do a blog. But what will I do? I'm really undisciplined. If I don't force myself into particular things, stick to them. So decided I have an angle where I would write at least one thing every day and I thought it's stuff that I could maybe develop into funny stuff to use for stand-up comedy and I thought about it for a while before I started and I came up with the persona of Mr. Angry and I decided yeah I'm gonna write these things where I get really angry about things that are essentially quite inconsequential and I'll write at least once a day for a year and that's where the angry 365 days a year 
thing comes from that you see occasionally on my banners and whatnot. And I actually did that. I put at least one new entry on the blog every day for the first year. In fact, in the first year, I probably put about 400 entries on the blog. Uh, and that was really stressful occasionally remembering to do that. But uh, after the first year, I lightened up a bit. I still blog semi-regularly between 10 and 20 times a month usually but I don't let it stress me anymore and I, I actually do far more YouTube videos than I do written blogs I suppose I should, could just put the YouTube videos every day I do that sometimes sometimes that's what the blog post is a YouTube video uh, but uh, these days I actually find it easier to do the YouTube videos than writing something out because I take a lot of time when I write something a couple of hours usually and it doesn't take me that long to do most of my YouTube videos I can take that long when you take into account the uh, editing and rendering and all that sort of shenanigans but the actual shooting planning sometimes scripting and shooting that takes usually less time than a really involved blog post takes me Oh, but how did I transition to YouTube videos? I transitioned to YouTube videos. I'd been blogging for probably a couple of months. Uh, and I was thinking, okay, I need to push myself to take this further. And I was getting some feedback from the readers I'd developed on the blog who said, uh, yeah, take it further. And I was thinking of doing the live stand-up. And uh, I was tossing around the idea of podcasting just recording some monologues and putting them online and at about the time I was tossing that about I finally got broadband internet at home and I thought hell why not go the whole way leapfrog forget about audio and go video which is what I did and I started putting stuff on YouTube and again this was still in mind in my mind I was building this up to be something that uh, I did live as a stand-up. So all the YouTube videos were trying to work out funny ideas that could maybe work as a stand-up. And I did try stand-up. There's a couple of videos of me back when I was still wearing the mask. Doing stand-up in that mask scared the hell out of live audiences. That was an interesting thing to learn. That didn't work because it scared people. Uh, but I have decided stand-up is relatively 20th century online new media, new millennium is the way to go. I know some really good stand-up comedians through Adrian, like people who are way funnier than me, They're very good stand-up comedians, and if they get 20 people to come to a live gig, that's something of an achievement. Yeah. 50 is great. If they got a hundred people in a crowd, they'd be ecstatic. It is really hard to drag people out to live shows. And, you know, it's got to the stage where I whack a video up on YouTube and a couple thousand people watch it. They would kill for an audience like that. So I really think there's much more a future, much more an opportunity to potentially do something career-wise by pursuing the online media rather than the uh, old world stand-up routines. That's what I think, anyway. And mind you, the trade-off, they'd be pissed off I'd be getting this big audience, but uh, a stand-up comedian doesn't write that much new material. They tend to do the same routines at different shows for a year or more. Whereas I'm doing new stuff, usually at least five days a week. So that's the trade-off. I keep doing new stuff and they get to do the same stuff over and over. So it doesn't all work my way. Some of it is in their favor. So that's how I got to YouTube. That's why I'm on, why I was on YouTube. It's because I thought I could use it as a stand-up routine. Why I am on here is because I think there is potentially a future here. And as has recently been shown uh, in an article that was in the New York Times, a couple people have 
come out and said how much they earn. Uh, Michael Buckley of What the Buck Show said there's got the stage where he can earn a hundred grand a year. Uh, Corey, Mr. Safety, uh, said he's earning ten to twenty grand a month, about half from YouTube ad revenue and half from other sponsored stuff he does. So you can earn, you can earn a lot of money from this wacky new media world. All right, viewers, now you get me instead of the view, maybe a mix of me and the view, depending what the camera operator chooses to do. So where was I up to? Just had explained how I got to YouTube, why I'm still here, what I potentially hope to gain, uh, the fact that some people are gaining quite a bit from it right now. Which brings me to a question I get asked a lot. Ooh, how can I get famous on YouTube? Uh, how can I get as many subscribers as you, as views as you, as whatever? I will be honest with you, that question is kind of annoying when it's asked by someone who has only done a handful of videos or has only been on the site for a couple of months. The first part of the answer is work hard. Okay, so how do you get as many as I have? Well, work at it constantly for a couple of years, you know, step one. Uh, in fact, I still find it kind of funny that people ask me how to get a lot of viewers, subscribers on YouTube because I really don't think I get that many. At the time of recording this, I've got about 9,300 subscribers, which is extremely good for me. I like that. You know, it doesn't really compare to the people who have 300,000 uh, or even just the top Australian community channel is over 100,000. So, uh, yeah, I do think I'm possibly the wrong person to ask, but people ask anyway. Uh, a year ago, I only had 1,000 subscribers. That was after 18 months of working at it. So, yeah, the first part of the answer, how to get subscribers and viewers on YouTube, work at it for a long time, be in it for the long haul. The bad news is it's harder than it's ever been. The more people come on YouTube, the more people who are trying to get noticed on YouTube, the harder it is for anyone new to get noticed on YouTube. Now, in yon olden days, all of a year, a year and a half ago, uh, one of the main things I would say to people if you want to get noticed, interact with people, do video responses, you know, comment regularly on other people's videos. The, the whole video response thing has kind of lost meaning in the last year or so. YouTube changed the default setting on your video uploads a while ago to automatically accept video responses. I used to switch that off every single time I uploaded that I had to authorize a response because I only want responses that are actually responses. Uh, a lot of people didn't, uh, particularly on the big names. And of course the way to get noticed was to do a video response for one of the big names, something they liked, that they would have tagged their video and people would see it. I, I did that a lot in the early days. That just doesn't work anymore. When the big names regularly get, you know, literally hundreds of video responses, it loses meaning and you get lost in just the mass of people who are doing it. Uh, now, YouTube has recently changed the default back uh, for video responses, so the automatic default when you upload is make me approve videos before uh, video responses before they go up. So that may 
improve things a little for that route, but yeah, that is not as good a way as it used to be. It's still not a bad idea because it gets you involved in interacting, uh, but it's not a magic bullet. Before I go any further into ways to get your videos seen on YouTube, I do just want to throw out there that if someone just boldly asks the question, uh, how can I be famous? It's a ridiculous question. Uh, Ricky Gervais got notorious a few years ago for answering that question by saying, murder a prostitute. Because if you kill someone, you're going to be famous. They're going to mention your name in the newspapers as a murderer, just not necessarily a good thing. So I do think that question is fundamentally wrong. Uh, in this day and age, I'm not surprised people ask it because you look at the magazines, switch on a TV, you see people who do have fame who certainly have no discernible talent. So I'm not surprised people ask the when will I be famous question more than ever. I still think it's a rubbish question to ask. If you want to get somewhere and still have a soul at the end of it, my recommendation is choose something that you want to do. Choose something that means something to you. Choose something that you can put your heart and soul into and get good at it. Get really, really good at it. You don't have to be the best. You just have to really mean what you're doing. Have a bit of heart and soul. Now, whether that's music, comedy, dramatic acting, uh, the personal video blog type of thing, uh, because, you know, diarists have been big throughout uh, the history of literature, so there's no reason that a particularly compelling video diarist shouldn't be uh, a huge hit in the future. But work out what it is you want to do and just work at getting good at that. The guy I was mentioning before, Adrian Kalir, who's a director, one of the things he coaches everyone on who works with him, and this really helped me. Uh, I was working with him on some intensive coaching about a year or so ago. And the thing is, while the initial impulse is to say, well, why aren't I famous or why don't I have all the attention or credibility that person has? Because we can all point to someone and say, okay, they're rubbish. They've got no talent. They're no good. They're not funny. They're not entertaining. They're not interesting. They're not talented. I'm better than them. They've got all this attention. Why don't I have that attention? That will eat your soul away. And the big danger on looking at what other people have and complaining about what other people have uh, and complaining about other people's victories, you miss your own. And that I've seen that happen to people so many times. They're so fixated on complaining about what other people have. When something good comes their way, they completely miss it. And it's only years down the track they realize, oh, there was that moment, everything came together for me, and if only I'd capitalized on that, things could have been different, but I was you know, too busy complaining about other people. The thing is, you can't change that other people have success, and you won't get much argument from me that a lot of people who have uh, success, fame, attention are not very talented at all. I frequently get people uh, giving comments to me, they're being supportive in their own mind, they're going, oh, you're way better than you know, person X. Uh, 
I just want to throw in aside. At one stage, ages ago, I referred to a fictional person who was an idiot as Douchebag X. And there's actually someone on YouTube with the username Douchebag X. And some people thought I was referring to them. I wasn't. I didn't know they existed. So there's also probably a user called Person X, but I'm just going to go with, you know, Person X. Someone says to me, this guy uh, is nowhere near as good as you, got 10 times more subscribers. That's not fair. You should have more than him uh, because you're better than him. Now, first up, I don't always agree. Everyone has their own personal tastes. And sometimes when someone rags on another person, it's someone that I quite like. Uh, but you know, quite often it is someone who I think is useless or at the very least extremely overrated. But I try really hard not to dwell on the fact that there are people who aren't as talented as me, don't work as hard as me, uh, aren't as funny as me, however you want to see it, and yet they have heaps more attention. Because if I spent too much time thinking about that, I'd go crazy. And I'd prefer not to go crazy. So that's what I try to just stay positive. Think of yourself, work on your own act, whatever that may be, rather than worry about other people. And honestly, I'd rather celebrate other people's success than rip on them. Because when somebody does well, uh, even if I don't like what they're doing, the fact that they've proved, well, someone can do well, so that means maybe I can as well. So if you celebrate other people's success, I think it opens the door more likely for your success in the future. I'll go on now to one of the things uh, that I got asked to talk about, which I think was prompted by my recent visit to America to give my impressions of America. Now, with a huge disclaimer that this was an incredibly narrow uh, experience of America. I was there for a week and I was only in San Francisco and LA and I was hanging out with YouTubers the whole time. So, it was not uh, a very broad experience of America. It's all limited to, you know, only talking about San Francisco and LA. And I'll throw in, people might have thought I was about to say something bad, but I actually did not have any bad experiences while I was in America. Uh, I did have a bad experience on the plane, which I recounted in another video, with a horrible, crazy woman who happened to be American. I think the crazy was a bigger contributor than the American part of it. But my actual time on the ground in America was quite enjoyable, uh, even when I was by myself. It was really good. It is fun looking at the differences because so much is the same, because we're broadly very similar cultures. So the little differences really stand out. You do have way more crap food in shops, in the convenience stores, in the supermarkets. Uh, sweets, lollies, candy, chocolate, just real crap. You have way more of that. And it's way cheaper. And the drinks, uh, the soft drinks, are way cheaper than they are in Australia. Uh, as Corey, Mr. Safety, found when he was in Australia, the fresh food in Australia is broadly cheaper and of a better quality than in the US. Like, he has bad reactions to red meat and cheese in the US, but he ate red meat and cheese in Australia without the bad reaction. Uh, which just goes to show that it's the content of the stuff and what a lot of Americans regard as fresh food or real food we wouldn't really in Australia. 
but yes, if you're into soda and candy, America's your place because it's cheap. Oh, and there's way more variety in the drinks too, in the soft drinks at the convenience stores. I had fun exploring and experimenting, and a lot of people have probably seen what happened when I drank the giant can of Monster, and I really drank that can, and I slightly exaggerated the effects, but... I was really tired when I drank it, been up to 4am playing Left 4 Dead with Corey and I was really tired, it was probably about noon when I woke up but I was still really tired uh, and that just kept me going for ages through to 4 the next morning playing Left 4 Dead again really. So yeah, that a 1 litre energy drink, that'll do it to you, set you right off. But Broadly, like I said, Americans were really nice to me. I wore, a lot of the time I was wearing my t-shirt, particularly when I was walking around San Francisco, because there were long periods of time when I was walking around by myself. I was wearing my t-shirt that I bought from the XKCD website that says in big letters, just shy, and then in small letters, I'm not antisocial, you can talk to me, honest. And that really works. It uh, makes people talk to you. It's a real conversation starter, which is pretty cool. So, yeah. Oh, there are locusts. I'm just breaking here. Oh, there is a swarm of them. They're just smacking into my windscreen every five seconds. Oh, gross. I'm going to have no visibility in a minute. I'm going to have to stop and clean the windscreen. Okay. The swarm seems to have passed. Uh, that might happen again as we get further into the country. Okay, that was a diversion, viewers. I was squashing locusts with my windshield. <laughs> uh, you got to have variety on these long drives. Uh, so, yeah, going back to talking about Americans, I had a very narrow view. Uh, I was hanging out with people who were, I guess I was predisposed to like, people with similar interests to me and I did like them and I did have a good time but I do think in you know in very broad terms most people in most places in the world are going to be decent to you if you're not a complete jerk like I said I, my one jerk was uh, of all the luck like I have no jerks my whole trip in America the one I get is sitting right behind me on a plane so I can't escape and the psycho spends all this time kicking the back of my chair. That was, yeah, that was great. But, yeah, very briefly, that was my experience of America. It was good. Another thing people have asked me is what I see as my future on YouTube. How long will I stick around? What do I plan to do? What do I want to happen? Those sorts of things. I am keeping that fairly open, but I do also have a couple of specific ideas for the future. Uh, I will keep doing the sorts of things that I do now, <laughs> random stuff, uh, sort of humorous reenactments and exaggerations of things that happen in my day-to-day -day life, and my take on news stories, the angry news. Oh, that just reminded me. I got diverted a while ago. I was talking about ways to get noticed on YouTube. And I got diverted on my rant on don't try and be famous, try and be good. I will give you a couple of other tips. Now, besides the video responses which I mentioned, doing topical videos gets people's uh, attention. Sometimes surprisingly so. Like I do... Sorry, I've been drinking fizzy drink. Uh, sorry, that distracted me. I'll try that again. I think we'll leave that in. Uh, like I, I do the angry news every now and then when a news story catches my eye. Uh, and sometimes those just get the normal amount of views. For me, normal is about 2,000. Uh, sometimes it'll catch a few more people's attention, might get 
5,000, uh, sometimes you know, 10,000, even 20,000. Point being, if you happen to do a video on a topical issue, people are often searching on it. I always forget that because I don't do that on YouTube. I've got so many subscriptions. All I do is keep up with my subscriptions. I don't search for videos on particular topics or hardly ever. So I forget that other people do that. So sometimes when I've done a topical video, the viewer numbers will explode. Now again, it helps if you're doing something good. Why I don't do this all the time, why I don't do it every day, uh, or multiple times every week, and I could, I have to feel inspired. I could just churn stuff out, just look at the news story and go snap, 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 snap. But, uh, <coughs> sorry, more bubbles. I could just churn them out, but I actually prefer to only do it when I'm inspired to do it. Uh, and by inspired, normally, on almost any news story, I can think of one joke, uh, usually two. But when it gets to the stage where I look at a story and I see a script just instantly forms in my mind and I see three, four, five, six jokes, that's when I know it's something to do, when I've got that whole narrative going on in my mind. So that's when I'll do a topical video when I feel like I can do it justice. But yeah, if you feel you can, it often does get a lot of people watching. Bizarrely enough, uh, the one I did, which I had to get talked into, I, I almost never do videos on what I regard as really obvious stories. Great big mainstream stories that everyone's doing videos on. I usually don't do videos on them. Sometimes I get talked into it. One I got talked into, which I was glad I did, uh, about this particular young idiot. This is about a year ago now. I forget how long ago it is. Uh, his name's uh, Corey Delaney Worthington. People always argue that point when I say his name. Is his name Delaney or Worthington? Well, uh, I believe his mother's name is Delaney, and that was the name he grew up with, and she remarried, and his stepdad's name is Worthington. So he's call it Corey Delaney Worthington. I'm pretty sure his stepdad wants to disown him, so I think we should just stick with Corey Delaney. But anyway, he got notorious for, if you don't know who he was, he got notorious for having a party when he was 16. Had a party when his parents were out of town. No big deal. Uh, but he put it out on MySpace. And he put his home address on MySpace, saying, you party, no parents, woo! And there is a bit of a problem in Australia with gate crashes at teenage parties. Uh, they do get out of control sometimes. There have been fatalities from fights that break out because of gate crashes. Anyway, this one wasn't actually particularly serious. Just a large crowd of people showed up. The number that was thrown about by the police and the media was 500, which was a suspiciously round number to me. Maybe there were 500, maybe there weren't. There are a few. I don't, hey, look, a hundred drunken teenagers is a lot. Uh, and the cops came, the neighbours were all freaked out. Uh, someone threw a bottle at a cop's car and cracked the windshield. Basically, it was pretty tame. It was not that wild. But it got blown out of all proportion by the media. And he was invited on one of these evening <coughs> so-called current affairs shows, just tabloid rubbish shows. Uh, to defend himself and he acquitted himself quite well and the host was pathetic she was trying to be all tough like be his mum or something and she just came off like an idiot and honestly this kid's not very bright but he came off way better than the host of the show so that was the angle I took in the video uh, when I discussed it now that's been viewed over 200,000 times which, and it's got over a thousand comments, I think, which makes it one of my most viewed, most commented videos, which I never would have guessed when I made it. Uh, so that's why I say when people say, oh, what should I make videos on? Uh, it helps if you make it on something that you just feel you can make a good video about, because I'm actually lousy at picking 
what gets lots of viewers. I had no idea making that video would get so many viewers. I probably would have done it sooner if I'd have realized. But uh, yeah, so that is another way to raise your profile on YouTube is to do something topical. Do your reaction to the news story of the day. People usually like it if you can be funny about it. Have a bit of a rant maybe. Now of course the low road is uh, the, the drama route. Just uh, abuse someone, another YouTube user. Say why you don't like someone on YouTube. I've said often enough how pathetic I think that is. Uh, yes, short term, you can get attention for doing that. Hey, some people have learned. Do a hater video about me and some people will jump on, but honestly, if you, I've said this before, if you do that, you're a wanker. Uh, the only people who will jump on and say, yeah, woo, are other wankers. So, you know, just all group together and be idiots together and leave the smart people alone. So, you know, whoever's the flavour of the month ends up being the whipping horse. Like, there must be a thousand, uh, that's probably way understating it, thousands of videos saying, I hate Fred. Because, you know, he's the most subscribed. God knows how many subscribers he's got now. No, not a fan. Don't watch him. Uh, I did check it out to see what it was about. What he does, I think he does quite competently. Just not my thing. Uh, he was at YouTube Live. I didn't see him interacting. I thought he was sort of separating himself from people. But then I saw other people's videos and he did interact with people. He seemed very personable young chap because he is only 15 or 16 or something so I just don't see the point in ripping on someone like that don't worry about who you don't like just don't watch who you don't like and like I was saying before don't waste time pointing out that some people who have lots of attention don't deserve it just focus on you and what you want to do and focus on the positives. The negatives will always be there and all that happens if you focus on negative things is you become a negative person. And that's just a lose-lose scenario as far as I'm concerned. Stick with your own game, stick with what you can do and get good at that and don't worry about other people. Simple as that. Well, we've entered New South Wales now. We just crossed the border from Victoria into New South Wales. Woo! Yes, that we have a ceremonial cheer every time we cross state borders when we're driving. Happy face. Yeah, and uh, I forgot this new bit of road, actually. You used to have to go through the little city of Albury but there's a bypass now. Don't have to deal with those humans. Can stay on the road and keep driving in our machine. Our beautiful, shiny machine. Happy face. We keep getting locusts as well. I'm thinking once we get right out into the country, they are looking like they're in plague proportions. Once we go out another hour or so, if they keep coming out, I think they'll try and get shots of us driving through locust swarms. Just for variety! Because it's a bit freaky, actually, when you can just see hundreds of them in front of you and the splat, splat, splat as they hit the windshield. And, hey, which reminds me of a joke. What's the last thing that goes through a locust's mind when it hits your windscreen? What? It's bum! <laughs> oh, dad joke, look out. I got distracted again, didn't I? I had started to talk about the future on YouTube, what I saw as my future, what I wanted to do, and I got distracted talking about something else. I will go back to that. I do have 
a couple of ideas for slightly or very different things in the future. So one in particular, I'm going to want people who are in or around Melbourne or who are going to be around Melbourne to be in because I'm sick of shooting things by myself and I want some extra bodies for some of these things. So the script would require more than one person. Uh, it would actually involve me hurting you a bit. You know, it's all in the name of art, so don't be a wuss. So anyone who's in or around Melbourne, who's going to be, can be, wants to get involved, let me know so I can start planning that. Uh, that's actually going to be a series. Just, just possible I might start another channel for the first time. If this series works, I might give it a turn channel. Might not. Might just keep doing them on mine, even though they're quite different to most of what I do. I'm certainly going to get a URL for it as, you know, .com. So I'm not going to say what it's called yet, so I don't lose that. In fact, there's two I'm going to start their own websites. Uh, the second one is more of an interactive game. And again, it will start on my channel. It is possible it might end up with its own channel. I have developed most of the rules, the basic rules for this game in my head, but it is interactive. And I think as it goes on, people would be able to help me with some good rules for it. Elements of it are definitely going to be a drinking game as well. A competitive, it's going to be a competitive sport, okay? Uh, within a few years I'll be pushing for it to be in the Olympics. It's that good, okay? It's that good. So stay tuned for that one too. I don't necessarily need other people to be in those videos, although I guess I could do them with other people, but I can do those ones on my own. But I do want people for the other ones. So yeah, uh, there will be at least two new ongoing series next year. Uh, in broader terms, I have started to formulate quite a specific plan, uh, basically for a career change. As I mentioned way back at the start of this video, I'm an IT contractor, business analyst. I have been doing that for a long time. I think I'm due for a change and I enjoy this uh, video making and the performing, presenting bits are much. In fact, in my day job, I do a lot of presentations. Uh, I run workshops and information sessions and I quite like presenting to people. And being in IT, there are, uh, what's the right word for them? Conventions? That's more a fan thing, a convention. Uh, I'll, I'll use that word, I can't think of the right word. Like conventions where everyone gets up and does presentations on various topics on IT. Sometimes really technical ones and sometimes more philosophical ones uh, about, you know, the future of a particular thing. A lot of the time they're just trying to sell their product, that sort of thing. But they always, they have the funny guy, usually gets to close out the conference. That's what people usually call them, conferences. Uh, the funny guy normally gets to close out the conference. And I've seen a couple of quite good public speakers do that. I could do it better. So I am working towards a career change uh, wherein I will be a professional public speaker. Uh, I'm going to be going back to uh, working professionally with my friend Adrian. Uh, he will be, as I said, it will be a professional engagement. He will be my director and coaching me on how to get really sharp with the presentation. And I think I will do some of those as videos for YouTube as well. Basically just practicing 
various presentations on various themes. And in fact, the uh, ones of you with good memories, people who've seen the back catalogue, will actually recognise some of the stories I'm planning to use. Uh, because real life is often the best source for entertaining stories. And having worked in IT for you know, 12 or 13 years, I've got a few stories. Uh, some of them are worth sharing. So that's something else slightly different that will be happening next year. But yeah, I just figured I was thinking about it that this is what I really like doing. The, the talking to people, presenting to people, entertaining people. And while there is a possibility I could uh, build enough of an audience on YouTube to make a living from the ad revenue, as discussed earlier, a few people are. I basically need to get about 10 times the audience I've got here, and yeah, it's taken me two and a half years to get this much audience, so yeah, not holding my breath for uh, increasing my audience by 10 times, so looking at the alternative of being a professional public speaker, so look out for that one, that's something I'm planning. Uh, to start working on in the new year. And beyond that, again, I have been discussing uh, with people, because I did a theatre degree and I do some work with uh, my friend Adrian, who's a director. I do come into contact with a lot of people who are working professionally in the various realms of entertainment. Uh, we have been discussing things that could work there. When you do this sort of work, one thing you often lead to is, Oh, I want to do a movie. Yeah, not so much in Australia. The Australian film industry is a disaster area. Some very good films get made once every couple of years. There's one that's a commercial success. Usually a comedy. Not always, but usually a comedy. Uh, oh. My GPS is talking to me. I'm going off the road. What a, wait, brief diversion. Let's look out the windshield. It's got bugs squashed all over it. This is the rubbish little road we're on now. Last bit of road you saw, we were on this uh, great dual carriageway. Now we're all sharing one road. This is supposed to be the main highway between Sydney and Melbourne. That's rubbish. Now we're turning off this one altogether and going off to the country. Big time! So, yes, the landscape is changing once again. There's a bit of construction going on over there, some new roads, but keeping uh, on this little road, stuck behind a truck too. Oh well, we'll uh, cope, I'm sure. Back to what I was saying. I was talking about future things and I have lost my thread. I might have to edit this out while I ramble. Don't stop it. Have you stopped it? No, but there's a really low battery. That's okay, we'll keep going until the battery runs out. Tell me when it runs out. What was I saying before? Do you remember what I was saying? Um, you were saying the... Um, ah, film industry. People. Yes, 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 okay. So, you see you got me in shock? Yeah. Okay. Okay, before turning off the road distracted me, talking about what a disaster the Australian film industry is. Uh, and talking to people who work in it, they have a very low opinion of the people who work in the arts administration in Australia, the producers of films. So I'm not really sure I want to go that way, not in Australia anyway. But some really good stuff gets made for Australian TV. In fact, that's almost like the... Uh, serious end of entertainment in Australia and I did read a story once that years ago one of the guys who was uh, running one of the main commercial TV networks in Australia looked at the American entertainment industrial complex and realized Australia was never going to compete with Hollywood uh, just didn't have the firepower to compete and of course the big awards 
ceremony in America is the Oscars. All the others are also rands. You know, the TV award shows, bit of a joke. But, you know, apart from the people who win, I'm sure they think it's great. This guy decided Australia couldn't possibly compete with Hollywood on the film front. So he decided we should make our stars TV stars. And he really pushed the whole TV medium. And the major awards show in Australia is a TV awards show. It's called The Logies. How intellectual are we? Our commercial TV awards show is named after one of the inventors of TV, Logie Baird. <laughs> We're intellectuals in Australia. Even our trash has intellectual names. So yeah, the TV awards show is called The Logies. Uh, film awards in Australia are a real non-event. But The Logies is pretty big. So some quite good stuff gets made for Australian TV. One that's proving very popular in the US at the moment is uh, called Summer Heights High and that is a very good series. There's also some good dramas made in Australia and interestingly cables only just started taking off in Australia. It's existed for a while, I don't know, 10 years but it's been a real fringe thing. No one had it but it's just starting to get a toehold and in the last couple of years uh, the people running the cable channels have started to get adventurous and they basically tell a few people who do have established rep re reputations in mainstream, hey make a show for us, we'll give you complete creative freedom. You'll make nowhere near as much as if you were working for one of the big commercial networks, but you get to make your show the way you make it. You have complete commercial freedom. and. Uh, this resulted in probably one of the, the best shows <coughs> made in the last 10 years on Australian TV. It was called Love My Way. And the first series or two, particularly, well, just hard-hitting stuff. It was drama stuff. But it was really good. Like, it wasn't sort of soul-crushingly depressing, but it wasn't shallow either. It was really gutsy drama-making. Uh, like I said, probably the best made in Australia in 10 years. Not the flashiest, not, uh, you know, the glitziest, but in terms of quality of writing and acting and just being really gutsy with the subject matter, there's a really good show. Uh, if you get a chance to see that on DVD or if repeats running anywhere, I do recommend it. Love My Way, particularly the first and second season was very good. So. As cable starts getting more adventurous, there are avenues opening there. I do note the Comedy Channel in Australia is doing more and more original content. Uh, at, for the first few years of its life, the Comedy Channel was solely running uh, repeats of shows that had screened somewhere else in the world already. Either Australia or somewhere else had already screened them. But they've been doing more and more original content. So there's a potential opening there as well. So I will cert as I said, because I know people who work in those fields and I think I know online media better than most of those people. In fact, to be honest, there aren't many people in Australia who have a clue how the internet works from a business point of view which really quite bugs me. I want to work on that. So I think I know some really talented people, but they don't necessarily have a clue of uh, how to make things happen on the internet particularly. So I might work with some of those. And for instance, when I was talking about starting a career as a public speaker, People are so useless at uh, working the internet in Australia, like they know nothing about how search engines work or whatnot. I'm basically pretty sure if I do a whole series of blog posts talking about how I'm the greatest public speaker in Australia, after a while, when someone plugs into a search engine 
best public speaker in Australia, it'll come up with me just because I kept saying in blog posts, I'm the best public speaker in Australia. So the fact that no one in Australia has a clue on how to work the internet is probably going to work in my favour. So uh, yes, look forward to me referring to myself as the best public speaker in Australia, which is not purely narcissism. Obviously there's a bit of that in there, but if I keep making videos talking about being the best public speaker in Australia, it's really just so I show up in search engines and my new career gets off to a flying start. So that's what that means if you see that. Is it shooting? Yeah. It's a little bit of wetlands there. A slightly unusual feature out here in western New South Wales because it's so dry. So to get a little bit of wetlands like that is quite unusual. That is just outside the town of Forbes, which we are now coming into. Let you see a little bit of Australiana now. Uh, it probably bugs all over the windshield as little Miss Angry starts shooting out the front of the car. Uh, there were a lot of locusts, as I mentioned in a previous part of the video. A lot and lot of them. So, uh, have a look at what a typical small town in country New South Wales look like. In fact, Forbes is one of the bigger ones on the scale of small country towns. Uh, quite bigger. It's really only a few thousand people. We'll pass a sign at some point saying what the population is, I'm sure. But like most of the larger settlements, it's on a river, which is crossing the Lachlan River. That's what the town is on. I think we cross it again as we go through the town. It's a twisty, turny river. Uh, we're right on the outskirts of the town now, so you can see there's not a lot of anything really at this point. Even once we get into the town, you won't see a huge amount. There are one or two historic buildings. Oh, if you shoot out my window now, there's some older buildings that we're just passing here. That's called the Lachlan Vintage Village there. It's a little tourist attraction they have in Forbes, a recreation of like a colonial era country village. School kids get forced to go to it, uh, had to go to it as a kid. Oh, here's an unusual building, I don't remember that, that with the weird old car on the roof being here before. Mind you, I haven't come through here for at least a, a year or two, so lots of things can change in that time. Weird building with a car on the roof. Oh, it's a motor museum. Well, if I didn't have somewhere to go, I might even go and look at that. But uh, not today, we're just driving through this town. And, uh, oh yes, as I guessed, we're going to cross the river again now. Uh, oh, this is actually being given the grand name of Lake Forbes. My bad. Oh, a little fan. Oh, look, get, get a shot of the aeroplane out this window. That is a weird thing. A small Australian town's military hardware sitting in the park. Now, I don't know if anyone else in the world can tell me if they have that in their towns as well, but little towns in Australia, and some of the larger ones, have a real thing for military hardware in their parks. That was a, a Beaufort bomber, uh, but there's often tanks. Oh, I just swung hard there because I was busy talking and missed the turn. There's a, a pretty park in the middle of town, the Little Miss Angry shooting. There's the old town hall, courthouse, mayor's building, whatever. You can see there's a couple of older buildings here, nice style. The Bush Rangers Hall of Fame there, another, you're really trying to crack cash in on the historical thing here. Forbes is reputed to be the home or the stomping ground of a particularly famous Bush Ranger called Ben Hall. Not as famous as Ned Kelly. Ben Hall's probably the second most famous uh, 
popular legend has it he was a bit of a, a gentleman bush ranger uh, that he didn't hurt people and you know was actually just against the oppression of the rather corrupt police at the time and uh, would give money to poor people Robin Hood style my history is not that good so I'm not gonna put my neck on the line and say that's absolutely true but that's certainly the popular legend that's circulated about Ben Hall but uh, we're almost through town now so you can see there is really not a huge amount to it but there is a McDonald's you don't have to be a very big town to have a McDonald's these days you really just need to have a highway coming through your town and they'll put a McDonald's on it and you can tell we're in a country town we're now getting to the tractor sale yards <laughs> there's always tractors on sale uh, when you're in farm country and we are of course in farm country out here working our way through town now the truck sales very country uh, there's a, a golf club out this way too <laughs> the funny thing about golf clubs out here uh, this far in the country they're not allowed to water them really so they can be very dry uh, you can end up with rather than roughs and greens and whatnot basically dirt end up playing golf on clay but uh, that's it we just drove through Forbes and that is one of the bigger towns out here so that's a typical bit of Australiana for you viewers G'day viewers, well I'm back in sunny Melbourne now, Christmas is over and I think I've just achieved the longest period ever without uploading a video to YouTube, in fact I think it's the longest I've gone without uploading a video by quite a bit, I don't think I've ever gone more than three or four days before. So aren't I strong willed, not only did I not upload any videos, I didn't edit anything while I was away, I stayed away from videoing altogether, I did shoot the video of course in the car while I was driving and the astute will have noticed every day or so I was going on and checking messages and replying but I didn't do any video stuff it's about time I had a break I think now I did want to talk through a few more things stuff I didn't cover in the car well one was because I didn't think of it two there's actually one topic that I didn't really want to discuss with the little angries there and that's one I promised to discuss namely how to get away with swearing on YouTube I'll throw a disclaimer in here that uh, I'm not 100% sure on any of this now with the uh, changed rules in YouTube. I don't know what sort of things they may or may not do. Uh, but I'll go based on my track record. Because a lot of people have had videos taken down and they assumed or were told it was because of profanity, because they were swearing at someone or at something. And clearly, I swear a lot in some videos and I've never had a video taken down for profanity and people go oh but I, I just did this uh, I got taken down and uh, you did heaps of swearing and you can, didn't get taken down why is that uh, and I do the mildly stupid voice because to me really often it's blindingly obvious unless you're a little bit thick the difference uh, I don't make it personal I don't attack individuals or unless they're very public individuals like you know major politicians or celebrities or whatnot I certainly don't attack individuals on YouTube I don't think it's worth it I don't think it's a very good thing to do really I attack modes of behavior groups who behave in certain ways uh, sometimes not you know official groups but just people uh, who behave in similar ways that's how I differentiate it a lot of people attack individuals and get really personal and really vicious uh, I do get fairly vicious but I attack modes of behavior not individuals and I think that makes a world of difference and I should throw in I think that again I've never had any official discourse with anyone on YouTube on this topic I think it's obvious I think it's fairly obvious that that's a big difference every single 
time someone's pointed out to me, oh, such and such had a video taken down for no reason. Uh, or such and such had their channel cancelled for no reason. It's usually been a safe bet to say bullshit. Not only is there usually a good reason, uh, the person in question who's acting like a martyr tends to know the reason. Again, I'm going to take this back a notch and uh, it's almost a case of all bets off with uh, the new rules. I do know of one case, uh, Cruisin' By had a video where she just chopped up a bunch of swearing for fun. I thought it was funny and it was apparently taken down for that reason which I reckon is bullshit. Myself, Not bullshit, I don't think Cruisin' By is lying, I think the person on YouTube who made the call to take it down, I call bullshit on them. I don't think there was any grounds for taking it down. It was just swearing. It wasn't at anyone. But hey, given that no one at YouTube ever talks to us, we don't really know what's going on. So that's by the by. That uh, has happened quite recently, obviously, since the new rules come in. But yeah, so my first thing, if you want to stay on the safe side, is don't make it personal. Don't viciously attack individuals. Uh, it works for me uh, on a personal level as well as on a video making level. So, oh, and the other thing, if you're going at people, a loophole that's often used to shut people down, shut their videos down, is the, the copyright laws. If you use a piece of someone else's video when you're having a go at them, they'll say, ah, oh, that's, you know, not allowed. I don't give them authority to use that video of me, it gets taken down. I think that's bullshit, uh, but it is the rules. If you use a video without permission, it can get taken down. You don't even have to worry about what the actual copyright law is. It's in the terms of use on YouTube. I think it's bullshit terms of use, but it is in terms of use. And when you and I signed up for accounts, we said we'd agree to the terms of use. Uh, so I also think that's lazy. I know a couple people have had videos taken down where they're criticizing someone this is someone on YouTube, and multiple cases I think it was someone who probably deserved to be criticised, but they used a piece of that person's video without that person's permission. That person complained, and the video was taken down. Now, under YouTube's rule, not only is that person justified, or they're within the rules by saying, no, take that down, I don't agree to it, I think it's given them an easy out. I think that... Uh, I'm going to keep waving my hand around at this bloody fly that's bugging me. I think that's going to happen. Uh, I think it's lazy. If you're attacking uh, a point of view or an attitude that some people have to find it necessary to use video of them, I reckon that's kind of lazy. I've never really found that necessary. Normally when you're going after someone, it's self-evident. So I don't use other people's video when I'm talking about uh, the behaviour they exhibit, not least because it gives them a loophole to go at you. Yeah, I know people have done it with mine and I have never made a complaint. I don't give a shit. Uh, in fact, if anyone ever manages to make a good hater video of me, I'll be the first to applaud them. I still hang out for someone to actually make one that's good. I get lots of them, uh, but they're shit and there's no point in me having a go at them because when someone makes an absolute pile of crap video where they look like an idiot saying that there's something wrong with me, uh, <laughs> well, they're out there making themselves look shit. And then if someone goes and looks at my video, whether they agree with me or not, my videos are far more competently put together. Uh, I think I come out on top. So I just let the wankers go who do that occasionally. But yeah, if you do that, you leave yourself wide open so yeah don't use someone else's video when you're criticizing them particularly not if you're going to swear and get vicious and personal because again I'm thinking I don't know for sure but those are cases where YouTube staff is much more likely to shut you down if you get if you're getting full on with the swearing particularly if you're abusing particularly if you're threatening someone you deserve it uh, that's one where I will go out that's the one thing I'll speak out against threatening someone or actually inciting violence in a serious way. That's a criminal offence pretty much everywhere as far as I know and anyone who does that shit deserves whatever happens to them. 
We all know that they're pathetic, lame little soft cocks who are never going to carry through on the threads. God knows I've had enough of them. And let's see, how many times in the last year have I announced where I was going to be publicly? Six? I don't know, something like that. And all these people with the big talk, they don't show up. Big surprise. Oh, and also, from now on, when anyone's organising any sort of gathering, and uh, I've seen this happen more in Australia than in other parts, although, then again, I don't pay as much attention to the organising of big events in other parts of the world, people start to get paranoid. Oh, such and such said they're going to do that. There's going to be a scene. There's going to be... And then there is. This person never shows up to cause trouble. It's never a scene because they're whiny little bitches who never carry through on anything they say. So can we please just calm down if there's going to be any more major gatherings in Australia there will always be someone who says they're going to cause a scene they're going to pick a fight with such and such blah 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 no they're not they're full of shit uh, they're not going to do anything can we all just calm down the only people who bother to show up to gatherings are people who want to have fun people who want to interact and carry on and on the off chance one maladjusted loser did show up and go, oh, I'm going to cause a scene. What? There's a hundred people who are there in a positive sense, in a group, and one idiot, and that idiot is going to have an effect. How exactly? Just let that shit go. Don't worry about it. But I should go back to my thesis, how to swear on YouTube. Well, it does help if you make it part of an overall piece, I think. Like, uh, I have... I have done cut-ups just for fun where it was just the bits where I was swearing, saying shut the fuck up, and see that's what worries me because that was what Cruise and Buy essentially did and seems to have had a video taken down just because it was swearing, which is kind of bullshit. Uh, oh, and I'll put a link also to a funny music video that uh, Vortex Neurofunk did, which is essentially doing the same stuff with me swearing with some sort of house music beats behind it. Uh, is good and I am probably going to be doing more stuff with Vortex Neurofunk doing some music for some videos on his channel and on my channel. I think we've talked about this, we don't have solid plans but I think it's going to happen. Uh, and he actually said, by the way, if you like the music he does or you have some ideas, he's actually really happy to talk to people about doing commission, talk about the sort of, man, flies, talk to uh, Kip about the type of music you'd like for something and he might be able to organise something with you. So, hey, people are always looking for music. Uh, Vortex Neurofunk, I will have a link in the usual places. Go check him out and uh, check out the video, which is hopefully still there. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, me swearing with some dance music. So, yeah, swearing, I think, works better if there's a context. If there's an overall piece, and normally when I'm swearing, even when it's the shut the fuck up videos, there's a, there's an arc, there's a, there's a whole... F thing I'm telling is there's a point to the video uh, it's artistic expression so I think that helps a lot if you want to be doing stuff whether it's in character and yes believe it or not I'm a character except what I do in the videos that's in character the fat Aussie bastard when he does his carry-ons he's in character he's a pretty funny bloke Pete in real life but that's character. People need to understand the difference between uh, an individual and a character they may portray, even if the character is really just an amplified version of who they are. It's still not who the person really is. Uh, and that's sort of uh, across the board with people who know what they're doing. So if you can do it you know, in character and in context, I think it's easier to get away with swearing. And like I said, if you're not exceptionally vicious and carry on. I mean, I know people who've done videos where they've taken a shit, literally taken a shit on the Bible or the Quran and then had a video of it sitting in the bowl and they wondered why those videos got taken down. <laughs> um, wow, I don't know. Now, if I was running YouTube, it wouldn't necessarily get taken down. I don't think that's breaking any laws. I think they're, you know, wanting to play sort of overly nicey nicey there, but again, <laughs> that's their terms of use and they can enforce them as they see fit. 
So yeah, another tip, if you don't want your videos taken down, don't be just incredibly vicious and profane and keep the bodily functions out of it. That tends to get stuff shut down. I think Christopher Mast had a video taken off just because he was sitting on the can, he was taking a piss while the video was showing. You could hear it. Uh, he didn't see anything. He wasn't doing anything particularly off, but someone complained and it did get taken down. So bodily functions are apparently a no-no. So there you go, kids. That's Mr. Angry's tips to you on how to get away with swearing on YouTube. Okay, one more little ramble I wanted to have maybe to close out this video because before shooting this stuff, I did actually edit to, together the stuff from the drive. It was a bit over an hour long, and because people had been challenging me to make a longer video than my last longer video, and that was over 90 minutes long, so I have to keep this ramble going for more than half an hour to pass out. I'm not sure I will. That wasn't my specific goal to do that, but we'll see what happens, because this is something I've been thinking about for a little while, and I thought I'd share, because this is, again, type of thing people ask me uh, how can I make my videos better your delivery is really good how do you do that and I did talk about my training when I was driving in the car but here's some tips on performance because if you're putting videos of yourself on YouTube that's what it is it's performance whether it's music whether it's uh, like the personal uh, blog type videos you're being a video diarist whether you're trying to do humorous stuff, uh, as I attempt to largely, or dramatic stuff, or even if you're doing the type of topical videos like, you know, for instance, What the Buck Show, when Michael Buckley is doing his showbiz gossip, that's, perform that's clearly performance. And there's a lot of people who do topical videos and various themes, and they're successful to varying degrees, but it's all performance. If you're doing topical videos, that's performance as well. So that's what I want to make clear. A lot of people sort of argue, oh, it's not performance, it's personal, it's honest. Even if it's a personal, honest story, it's still a performance when you tell it to someone. That's, look, let's get uh, deep and meaningful here. That's one of humanity's oldest things, sitting around a campfire, sharing stories. That's one of the oldest ways of making contact with your fellow humans. And quite frankly, the people who tell stories the best, even when they're true and honest, uh, they end up being the more popular storytellers. So I'm gonna throw in a few tips on performance. And one of the most important things, I think, about performance is it has to be believable. Now, what that means will change depending on what you do. Like, as I was saying, like, what the buck doing showbiz gossip, it's gotta be believable that he's really into that topic. He injects all that life into it and his spirit comes through. I think for that, or any other topical video maker, for their videos to work, you have to believe that they're really into what they're presenting. And I think that's where some of the topical video makers fall down. They're you know, hitting all the notes on the news of the day or whatnot. But me personally, I find myself thinking, I just don't believe what they're doing. They're they are playing a character, they are running through, but I, maybe cynical is the right word, they're being cynical. They're, they're trying to push the audience's button, but they're not believing it themselves, and I think that comes across. So that believability is important. And if you're just making personal videos, personal blogs, that has to be believable too. I mean, I did see something farcical recently where someone was trying to uh, relay a story that was upsetting and they did fake crying, like really, really fake, really obviously fake. The situation they were relating may have been true or it may have been truly upsetting to them, but the fake crying was so obvious. It just undermined the whole thing. Now I know a couple of people who do really personal videos, and they don't necessarily cry, although they do sometimes, uh, but the emotion that really comes through is just astonishing to watch that someone's willing to share like that. <laughs> I'm not. Buggy, I'd, I'm not into <laughs> dropping my guard, particularly 
on YouTube simply because of the amount of wankers out there who perceive that as weakness. Uh, although, mind you, some people probably think I do drop my guard occasionally, but uh, for my own standards, I don't think I do. I'm also not going to uh, point to the people I like who do really personal videos because uh, I think they've got the audience they want. They have really personal contact and it's just going to encourage some wanker to rip on them for daring to be emotional and daring to be honest. Uh, now the other believability, the sort of stuff that I do most of the time, the, the ranting, trying to be funny, trying to be dramatic, whatever, the that sort of character-based stuff, as a performer, you need to believe what you're doing somehow. Now, I'll try and relate this back to my training. I have fairly classical training, and for the naturalistic style of acting, uh, we were schooled in the Stanislavski uh, acting style. And that's sort of, it's very similar to like New York method acting, which is kind of a bastardization of Stanislavski. Method actors are going to get the shits with me over that, but I don't know. Method acting to me, and I am speaking from the outside here because I haven't done method acting, but it seems to me that people lose themselves in the role. Uh, you're an actor, you're not being the person, you're acting as if you are that person. Uh, I think you possibly should be able to not get lost in a role and still be believable. It's where the Stanislavski school comes in. Though one of the key things with Stanislavski, the way it was taught to me, referred to as the magic if. And the if is, uh, if you can successfully portray how you would react if this was happening to you, if you were the character, not be the character, not get lost in the character, but if you can successfully visualize and transmit outwards how you would feel if you were in that situation, then you can make an audience believe, you can really draw an audience in. And uh, I've also basically learned a few tricks along the line. The, the number one, if you can believe, if you can truly believe in the performance, that is absolutely the best way to be compelling to an audience. If, because quite seriously, if you believe it, the audience will believe it. Now, the sad fact is that's not always easy or even possible because you may be trying to do a character that is so far divorced from your own life and your own experience, you can't literally believe it. So you need uh, a workaround or a little trick. And a little variation on the theme uh, is essentially sense memory. If the character you're portraying is meant to be angry or you're doing a scene where you're meant to be angry rather than just reading the lines and shouting if you can remember a time when you were genuinely angry then that can really give believability to it particularly if you're doing it to another person uh, whether you're really with another person or if you're just doing the sort of stuff I do which is two cameras so there's an imaginary person if you can put the face of a person who made you really angry there, it is a good way to really build up steam. I do do that sometimes, but honestly, people go like, wow, you know, you, when you get angry, you get angry. Honestly, I'm usually talking about a topic that really does make me angry. And the head of steam comes naturally. I just build up to a point of, you know what, and anger goes bang, 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 bang. I'm not really angry, but I've created something in my mind that's solid enough that I can generate some real, genuine anger and fire it out. And thanks to the magic of editing, you don't see the five seconds later where I'm just, ah. that's the joy of video editing. It's a lot easier than stage acting, I'll tell you that much. And it's, it's not just anger, happy, the same thing. Remember a time that made you happy and you can be believably happy. Sad, uh, I can actually make myself cry. I'm not going to do it here. Uh, who knows, I might do it another day. But it's the same trick. <laughs> now there are some real tricks on the uh, 
crying front. You might, I've heard people say weird things like, get someone to stamp on your toe just before you do it, bring t tears to your eyes, or, you know, uh, rub some, have some uh, onion juice on your hands, or Tabasco sauce, or chili, and rub your eyes, and that will make tears come. Uh, the trouble with stuff like that is the actual pain, the actual hurting in your eyes, might distract you from the performance you're trying to do. There may be tears, uh, but <laughs> it, you might get distracted from the discomfort and not give a believable performance. Uh, again, remembering something that makes you, made you genuinely sad is a really good trick. Now, again, hopefully you're working from an, an idea or a script that's got some believable words in it, but then if you add on to something that made you sad, it doesn't have to be really, really personal. I remember watching a uh, choir rehearse, my girlfriend's in a choir, and they have a song in their repertoire called Sister My Sister, and it's, it's a pretty emotional song. Uh, I think it's basically about someone close to you dying and you're trying to make up for lost time with that person. And one of the rehearsals I saw, the choir leader is saying to the choir, you know, I want you to really feel it. So we've got the words. And so you pretend you're singing it to, you know, your sister, someone close to you. And someone in the choir went, holy crap, no, that's too personal. If I imagine someone I care about while I'm singing this, I would burst out in tears. No, I'll just, you know, take a step back from that. So you can't, it can't be too personal, because like, again, like, getting your toes stamped on it might distract you. Uh, I happen to be fairly easy to manipulate in the sense of uh, movies. Even, even commercials can get me. Commercials that are meant to trigger an emotional response in you. Uh, I, I can have an emotional response triggered, which is a bit weird, but it's useful from a performance point of view if I remember a you know, scene in a movie, for instance, something that was genuinely emotional, that can build the emotion up me. And then if the scene is good enough, I can cry naturally. You can cheat, you can use, uh, not water. Water doesn't look like tears, not even saline, even though that's what tears are. Uh, my mind has gone blank, but there are various stage props you can use that it's a really thick, liquid that you can sort of have concealed and rub it so then it run, runs down your face. But I can do real tears. Bizarrely enough, one that always works for me is the end of The Iron Giant. There's a, that's an animated movie. It's, oh, it's at least 10 years old now. It's really good if you haven't seen it. The Iron Giant, go check it out. It's directed by Brad Bird, who worked on The Simpsons and uh, more recently joined Pixar. He directed... The, the Incredibles, that was his first one at Pixar. I think he did Ratatouille as well. But, I'm diverging there, Brad Bird directed The Iron Giant. The final scene of that, which I won't give away, but the robot just says a couple of lines that echo lines that the kid said earlier, right, right towards the end of the movie. I, I can feel myself building up now. I'm not going to do it, not now. I'll save it. I might do it for another video one day. But that one has always worked for me. If I really let myself go with that and then go into a scene, I can make myself cry. That's something you didn't know about me, isn't it? I might let it go there. I'll edit this together and put it up. And this is going to be long. It probably won't be in high quality. I'll have to edit it first and check the file size and see if I can upload it in a format that will let you watch it in high quality. So it might be a bit dodgy picture-wise and sound-wise just to actually, you know, stay within the file size limit, even at one gigabyte. This is fairly long, so we'll have to see how I go with that. And yes, I'll be back to the punchy short videos here. Oh, I've got one in mind right now. Just this is coming back to some messages and, oh yeah, I am going to let loose a big spray. In fact, depending on how long this takes to edit, render and upload, the short one might appear first, but within a day or two, there will be a short one about something I'm genuinely angry about. So look out for that and lots more coming up in the new year, which is in the next couple of days. I hope you have enjoyed 2009. It's been a pretty damn good year 
for me uh, through YouTube met hundreds of new people this year. <laughs> it will be a challenge for 2009 to live up to 2008 basically, but that's what life's all about, challenges. So I intend to make 2009 a big one. I hope you do too. I hope you can stay along for the journey and you will be seeing me a lot of times if you do. Catch you later.